So for years, you like that, huh? Oh, thank you. For years, you've been coding wrong. That's probably an arrogant statement, but it's meant to provoke some thoughts. And in this session, I want to present some ideas that I hope will challenge you and convince you to shift the way you do application development in Angular. Today, we're going to talk about push-based architectures using RxJS and facades. And of course, my mouse doesn't work. Classic. So traditionally, we implement code in the following way. And this is what I call the pull-based approach. We can do things, for example, where we can call a service, a pagination service, and update the pagination and get a response back. We can iterate over an array and extract the full username and get an array of, or a, a list of full usernames. We can also do asynchronous things where we could, for example, use a promise to listen for a mouse click event. We can even call the HTTP service to get a list of remote users. And we're getting that list back via stream. But these are all pull-based approaches. You call them once, they respond, they're done. They're not going to return values over the future. Let's take a look at this one a little bit more again. So here's our HTTP service. We're making a pull-based call because what I'm saying here is the user dollar, it's a temporary stream. We make the call, we get the stream back. So the stream, the stream is constructed one time, we get one response, right? So even with RxJS and observables, our users, are st we are still implementing pull-based services and pull-based architectures. So what about a new approach? What if we could change the way we're thinking to do something that I call push-based services? Now, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of days about RxJS and NGRx and all these different approaches, and you're going to see a lot of similarities to th of those patterns here in this approach. So this is nothing new, but this is meant to be a paradigm change for the way you think. So now, what we can do is we can construct a stream, our user stream, using another stream, that will extract our users out whenever that state changes. And this stream now is a long-lived stream. One could say that sometimes it's a permanent stream, or maybe it's just a long one until someone reconstructs it. But it's going to be around and be used for as long as we want. We build it once, and we can get one to n number of emissions or events that come out. And our views, this is the most important thing. Our views can react to any time the data comes out with a new list of users, our views react to that. So here's some examples of some APIs or usages of push-based approach. Here we're using a user facade, and we have a pagination stream, and we're just getting a reference to it. Here we're calling an update criteria method with some search criteria, and we're getting a criteria stream back. Notice how with the user facade, we don't know what's happening underneath the hood, right? And we shouldn't care. We just know that we want these streams, they're long-lived, and they're just going to give us data when it's available. Here's some asynchronous calls, right? So the top two were synchronous. There's nothing that says these streams are synchronous or asynchronous. I'm just letting you know that the top are synchronous. But the bottom ones could be synchronous. What if user's facade stream doesn't have any data yet? That's OK. We've constructed a reference to it. We now have user stream, long lived, and whenever the data is available, that will be pushed through it. We can call search criteria with some new criteria and get a new stream, right? It doesn't matter when the data is there, just that when it's there, it will be pushed to us through the stream. So let's build an application, a very simple application with a pull-based approach and a push-based architecture, and we're not going to use RxJS. In this application, we have a list of users that we're loading from a cloud service. We have a very simple UI, right? We have an input control, some paginations. We have a button that says load the users that will trigger to load the users. And we have a show page button too, show page size. So the API to the cloud services says, tell me what the criteria is, the search term that you want to use. What's the page size, or how many um, results do you want? And I'll give you that result set back. And that's what we're going to implement, or I've already implemented, and I'll walk you through. So we'll start with the pull-based approach. So here, we've already gone over the UI for, for briefly. Here we have actually an input stream from our UI. In this case, we're using a form control and using value changes, and that's an input stream whose 
data will be used in the UI to trigger a call to the user service. And when we trigger the call to the user service, we're saying find all users with the new search term criteria. Again, this is a poll-based approach. So in this case, I don't want any data to be managed inside my view, right? We, we know that one of the best patterns is if you're going to share data, keep it outside of the view, keep it with NGRX, we have some state management, et cetera. So we're going to emulate that approach. So here we have a user interface. We have a pagination interface, so we define sort of the data structures. And we even have a defined an interface for the response coming back from the server. Now we'll define our service. Later, I'll change the name from user service to user facade, but they're very close, right? The terms can be intermixed. Here, the service has some data state that it's managing internally, except this data is public, right? So that means anyone can read these properties, users, criteria, pagination. Again, once they read it, that doesn't mean it will change later that they'll get changes that that data's changed on the service. So again, it's a pull-based API. We have the constructor, and we have our method, right, to find all users. So with find all users, once you call it, we're going to take the current criteria in pagination, build a URL, make a call to the remote service. When that response comes back, we're going to extract the list of users, and we're going to return that through the request dollar stream. But we're doing something a little bit more here, which is pretty nasty, but really common. Notice the tap. The tap says, hey, also save it in our local internal state. Now, for those of you who have gone down this route before, you know there's already some problems brewing. All right? So let's take a look at a live demo here. So in this demo, if I refresh the page here, and this, these stack places are available online. They're, all the source code's available. You can look at it later. So notice the user list is empty. We have a search team that we populated because we initialized our state. And when the UI loaded, it pulled that, those, that, those settings out. If I change here, I can show the page size. I can change here. But nothing's happening, right? Nothing's happening to reload the data. So I have to actually write code to reload the user list. OK, so I'll load the user list. That's cool. But now let's make some changes. And I deliberately did that to say that when I made changes, I haven't made a call to the server, so I'm just going to clear the list. So now I have to reload the list. I can change the page size, but now I have to reload the list again. And granted, this is a simple ex example, but this is the idea of pull-based, right? You make changes, you're going to have to pull again. You're going to have to make another call to get the new data. We want to avoid that. We want to have a system where our views are super simple and they simply render whenever the data changes someplace else. We don't care how it changes. We just want to know when it changes. Okay. Oops. So I contend that when you're using push-based services or architectures, <clears throat> There's tons of dangers. I'm not going to go over all of these. But the two problems here are the following. <clears throat> if, the if this service is shared among multiple views, how are the views notified when the data changes, when the, when the pagination changes, or the criteria changes, or even the user list changes? Right? That's, that's problematic. And how do you share the results for find all users? So let's take a look at a better approach. And this was sort of an epiphany for me, this idea to not just use RxJS, but to use it to build push-based architectures is really f a paradigm changer. So with push-based architectures, let's take a look at this diagram. We have our input control with the search term. When the search term criteria changes, we're going to call, or the pagination, we're going to call a method, update search criteria or update pagination. That will then go into the user facade, because that's a method on the facade. The facade will make some changes internally, and then will update its state. It will probably trigger a reload for the users. And then we have three streams that come out. Notice the streams that come out are pagination, criteria, and users. So these are long length streams that the UI is using. And regardless of what happens in the user facade inside or in some other layer or even on the server, when the user state changes, these streams will re-emit the current data. This is a very powerful concept. 
So it also helps us build our APIs because we can then say, well, let's plan this, right? So here's our user facade. Like I said, it's similar to the user service, but here's our public API. We have three outputs. They're all streams, right? And remember, a stream is a, is a mechanism to channel data to you when it's changed. So we have a user stream, a criteria stream, and a pagination stream. We could define a search criteria stream as an input. That's a really provoking, um, pro provocative statement, right? We could have streams coming into our services and streams coming out. Notice you don't know how it's working yet inside. And we have two methods, update search criteria and update pagination. That is our API. That allows us to protect whatever we're doing on the inside, and you'll see in a few minutes some of the surprises we can have and the, f the flexibility that we have. So again, let's define our API, right, in, in code. So now we have a user's facade. We have three streams, an observable of the criteria, pagination, and users. We inject our HTTP service, and we have two methods. That's pretty cool. Let's see now how we implement that. Now, for performance reasons and change detection purposes and a few other things, we're going to do something that Redux promotes, that NGRX emphasizes, and we're going to maintain our data as immutable. That means whenever the data changes, we're going to create a whole new instance of the data. That gives us high performance. So we've defined our user state. It's analogous to what we had in the service, but now we're model gathered it into an object called user state or into an instance of user state. We've initialized it right here, underscore state. It's private. Notice that, the let. It's private. It's private to the module for user facade. And then we have our user facade, and this is where it gets interesting. We create a behavior subject, and we initialize it with the user state. Because with a behavior subject, anyone subscribes to it will get the last set of data that came out of it, which is the current user state. And then we have a state stream that's just an observable of that. Now, for those of you who are used using NGRX, this is very familiar, right? This is nothing radically new. So, but there is something interesting happening underneath the hood. The user facade, as I said, has three public properties that are streams, criteria, pagination, and users. And internally, it has the state, criteria, pagination, and users. That's that brown bar. But we can use those streams internally also. So when criteria and pagination change, the people who are consuming the stream on the outside will be notified. But internally, we can also listen for the changes on either of those streams and auto-call a remote service to load the users. And then once the users comes back internally, we update our user state, and then again we emit that out, and now the user dollar stream emits the new user list. So everything is hidden inside the user facade, but the API is super clean. I apologize if you can't see this quite clearly, but I'll just go over it briefly. So notice here's our, our criteria, pagination, and user streams. And we're doing something very similar to store selectors and NGRX. We're actually saying state.pipe, and we're extracting out the criteria or the pagination of the users whenever the state, the user state changes. Then, in, in our constructor, we build, we combine those two streams internally, and you'll see we use a switch map to call the remote service. When the response comes back from the service, we actually create a whole new state object using the spread operator, and then we assign it locally to our let variable, and then we emit it through the store, which then fires our selectors up above on criteria dollar, pagination dollar, and user dollar. So very similar patterns that you've been used to already. Notice that our methods don't return anything, but they also create a whole new state instance, and they also emit through the state. The outside world doesn't know anything about this. I'm also not using NGRX, right? So I don't have all these files and everything else. Let's take a look at this demo. I especially like this demo because it feels like the UI is fluid. So um, if I, so I'm going to show the page size so you can just see it. If I change this, it reloads. If I do it to five, it reloads. If I change anything in here, it reloads. And did you notice the gray flicker where everything was sort of disabled? So even while it's loading internally, 
I was able to see and, and modify my UI to say, wait, the, the data is, is, is pending. So in this case, the UI is very fluid, and I feel confident that whatever I'm doing with those controls, I'm seeing the proper set of data. And in fact, I won't show it just now, but in fact, the UI code, the, the, the imperative code at the, in the UI component is very simple. Any of this complexity is hidden within the facade. So with push-based architectures and reactive services, we have not only a fluid UI, but we can build, it's, more, it's easier to build wonderful user experiences. We have auto-searching for users when the criteria or pagination changes. We have the UI that auto-updates when the pagination or criteria changes. We have UI components that are now passive. They react to changes from our push-based architectures. We can do all of our testing outside of the UI for all of our business logic. And we can even use now Cypress or any of the other tools to do E to E testing just for our UI layouts and our styling regressions. So using push-based architectures makes it easy for us to do testing also. And let's say that we decide that the complexity we need to manage is a lot more than this simple use case. You can easily add NGRX under the hood. You can have the full power of effects and memo and memoize selectors and reducers and everything else that you want underneath the hood, but the view components and the API to the facade hasn't changed. So I'm hoping that this presentation has presented some new thoughts and maybe will convince you to experiment on shifting the way you try to design your services and couple to your components. Thank you very much.